Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very uh, proud to be here and uh, among such esteemed uh, colleagues as, as was announced earlier, uh, people that I remember from medical school. I went to medical school here and our residency and uh, stayed here obviously and, and worked as well. And I'm, I'm extremely proud to be uh, talking uh, in the honor of uh, Dr. Freedy because um, he was a, a giant in the field and uh, we miss him a lot. And um, uh, it's been nice to, to say something uh, a little about him. And in my uh, talk tonight, I'm going to be uh, first uh, addressing uh, some of Dr. Freedy's background and accomplishments. And then I wanted to move into some history, uh, history rather, of uh, death investigation in the United States and then in Arizona, then talk about the, um, the current uh, office, and then a little bit about what it is that we try to do in uh, death investigation, in particular the medical examiner's office. And then at the end of the uh, talk, and hopefully I'll have enough time, I want to talk about something that's very unique to uh, this, this part of the country, and that's the, the border crosser situation, which has had such a big impact on, on uh, death investigation in, uh, in this area. So <clears throat> I'll go ahead and uh, get started here. So uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, we lost uh, Dr. Freedy last year in, in February. And um, it's something of a shock, even though uh, I know there were some problems, he was having some health problems, I uh, just was not uh, ready to, to hear that he had passed. And um, I, I still expect him to be walking in the door of our office and uh, uh, just passing through briefly as he uh, usually did, and, and uh, it just doesn't seem right. Um, <clears throat> he was um, the son of a physician. And at an early age, he knew that he wanted to go into medicine. And, and I read and heard that uh, by the age of 12, he had decided that he wanted to be a pathologist, um, which is pretty incredible. And, and he uh, uh, got into medical school and graduated from the um, Marquette um, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin in 1955 and immediately joined uh, the Air Force. Now, this, this was common in his uh, family to be involved in the military. And uh, upon uh, entering the military, uh, he started his internship at Walter Reed Hospital, then went to Letterman, um, uh, Letterman General Hospital in San Francisco, and did a little work at the um, uh, AFIP at that time. And then after he got done with his residency, then he uh, began to embark on kind of a worldwide uh, tour. He, he had, was stationed in both the United States and and abroad and spent time, I know, in uh, England and Germany, and I think the family still has fond uh, uh, recollections of uh, Germany, Wiesbaden, was it, uh, where, where he was stationed. And then uh, in, in um, 1968, uh, he came to the uh, Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And <clears throat> there, I think, is when he began to really study forensic uh, pathology. He was working with a man named uh, Dr. Charles Stahl, and while he was uh, there at the AFIP, he um, spent about four months in Baltimore working with Russell Fisher, who is one of the, the gods of forensic pathology, uh, whose name is still on uh, the, the most popular textbook of forensic pathology there is. Um, he retired from the military in 1976. At the time he retired, he was the chief of the Division of Forensic Sciences of the uh, AFIP. <clears throat> And he was recruited to uh, come to uh, Tucson in 1976. Uh, he, he came in with, uh, while uh, Dr. Jack Layton was, was the head, and he would do regular surgical pathology, but he was also doing some forensic work. He was a, actually appointed the chief medical examiner for Cochise County. And so medical examiner's cases would come into a university medical center, and he would do um, those cases along with his other work. And then in um, 1981, he was appointed the chief medical examiner of Pima County. So he was chief medical examiner of two counties for a little while um, before um, uh, he, he uh, no longer had Cochise County because of Dr. Gary Flores. He remained uh, chief medical examiner until 1987 when he left to go to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology as a distinguished scientist. And it was at that time that he uh, tried to promote the idea of a, a, a medical examiner a, department for the Department of Defense, the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System. That was uh, implemented and he became the first Department of Defense Medical Examiner. 
Um, and he left uh, and uh, went into semi-retirement in, in 1992, came back to Tucson, where he uh, continued to be involved with a lot of aspects of uh, forensic pathology across the country. Th this is a partial list of some of his accomplishments. Uh, he, he as, as was mentioned, was the, the president of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He is one of the few recipients of the Gradwall uh, uh, medal, or medallion rather. Uh, only a few select individuals were given that. It's the highest honor that can be bestowed by the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He was a full professor of pathology at the University of Arizona. He received a meritorious uh, service award from the Department of uh, Defense. And, and he was involved with uh, so many different uh, committees. He was very involved with the College of American Pathologists. He gave uh, workshops. Um, he was a member of a lot of different um, uh, organizations within the, the country, uh, committees. Um, he uh, edited uh, a number of um, books, uh, wrote chapters, uh, a number of scientific articles as well. This is a photograph of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Dr. Freedy with um, Dr. Walter Berkby right here and, and Dr. Homer Campbell, who recently passed away, who is a forensic odontologist from uh, New Mexico. And of course, um, Dr. Freedy on, on the side here. As I said, I still think he's going to be walking into our office. We all at the office now have very fond memories of Dr. Freedy coming in uh, from wherever he happened to be at that particular time because he did a lot of traveling. He would drop off some candies at the uh, front desk and uh, he'd come to each room and sit down with everybody. And I, I think I remember most about, the thing I remember most of was, is his uh, just tremendous energy. He, he, I don't think I ever saw him sit down more than you know, two minutes, and, and even when he was, uh, his health was failing, he, he would still be moving around uh, <coughs> place to place and uh, just, just always seemed to have a boundless energy, and we, we really miss him. Well, <clears throat> when you talk about forensic pathology or death investigation, I think uh, this comes to mind for a lot of people who are uh, out, out in the, the public. Um, I, I used to pride myself on never watching these shows, uh, and uh, then my wife started watching them, so therefore I started watching them, and um, you get to see how far-fetched these, these things are, and I th maybe we're having a heyday in, in forensic pathology right now, I, I don't know, maybe this will pass, but uh, it's been going strong for some time, and these shows are very popular, and it has a very fantastic uh, viewpoint of the um, the world of uh, the criminalist and forensic medicine and whatnot. So which of these uh, individuals is a forensic pathologist? Ducky. Somebody said Ducky, yeah. <laughs> so Ducky, David McCollum, who uh, we remember from The Man from UNCLE. Um, and he's, uh, a, I know he's 80-something and still going strong. <clears throat> well, there are two main types of death investigation systems in the United States. The coroner <laughs> system and the medical examiner system. And the coroner system is a system where the coroner is an elected official. And that requirement for being coroner may only be that you be a registered voter. Uh, in, I think about half the uh, jurisdictions where coroners exist, the coroner has to have some medical background, but in many places it's not necessary. The medical examiner system is the newer system where a physician is um, appointed by some branch of government. In Arizona, the, the medical examiner is appointed by uh, each county. So I just want to talk a little bit about the history of these two death um, investigation systems. The, the older system is the coroner system again, which is a derivation of uh, the, the crowner who uh, was appointed by the king, I think back in the 1200s, to try to keep an eye really, try to put a check and balance on the sheriff because the sheriffs had um, uh, too much power out in the, the different sections of the, um, the kingdom. So the, the, the crowner would kind of keep an eye on the, the sheriff and also would uh, levy taxes and also was charged with um, uh, looking into uh, deaths and holding inquests over, over deaths. Oops. <coughs> Uh, in the United States, the coroner system kind of took hold um, in the 1600s when the uh, governor of uh, Virginia was told to start appointing coroners uh, to be involved with death investigation. So in physicians or practice, practitioners of medicine were involved with the death investigation, which was kind of solidified in the 1800s. 
And still today, uh, coroners serve about 40% of the population in the United States. The, this individual is probably the most well-known coroner, this gentleman right here from the Wizard of Oz, uh, who pronounced the, uh, the Wicked Witch uh, of the West, was it? Which one? West. So the medical examiner system uh, kind of arose be because there was some dissatisfaction with the coroner. The, the coroner, uh, being an elected official, often had some political motivation. And the coroner was, was pushing physicians around, having them do things without them having much to, s to say about it. And then the, the court systems were a little upset about uh, coroners for some of the same reasons. And so there was a move in the United States to uh, uh, put in a new system where a, a, a physician was in charge of death investigation. And the first uh, medical examiner was appointed in Massachusetts in, um, in 1877. Uh, the AMA, of course, is promoting physicians and trying to promote the medical examiner system. And there was a big push in the, in the 1900s to uh, uh, mid-1900s to have that done. And, and for a while, there was a transition and it moved rather briskly, but then the coroners dug their heels in and uh, being, having political power and, and connections uh, it kind of stopped the, the, uh, the progress. There was a um, report out by the National Research Council a few years ago that was um, looking into the entire field of forensics. Uh, the federal government asked them to do so, and in their report, um, they had a number of recommendations about how to correct the uh, forensic system in the U.S., and one of those um, recommendations was to remove coroners and create medical examiner systems in every state. Uh, there's a, that has not progressed very much, uh, and the, the coroners are still in hold and in positions. So forensic pathology, um, when you look at the physician who's best able to look at individuals, perform examinations, the pathologist was in the prime position to do that. And there, there was a move to make the uh, forensic pathologist more well-trained. And it was not called forensic pathology back then. It was called legal medicine. And the uh, CAP was formed in uh, 1948, around the same time the American Academy of Forensic Sciences was formed. And the CAP, along with the American Medical Association, tried to push the American Board of Pathology to establish a um, subspecialty of uh, pathology known as a forensic pathology. So they started to introduce some forensic pathology questions in the board exams. And then they, they finally had the first uh, group of diplomats of uh, forensic pathology in uh, 1959. Just uh, <clears throat> real quickly and get rid of these text slides. but. Uh, in Arizona, uh, back when Arizona was not a state yet, the first legislative session uh, created the, the coroner a position and said that coroners would be appointed for a two-year term. And the coroner would be notified <clears throat> whenever there was a homicide or a suicide or a suspicious death. And then they would uh, convene a jury. They would evaluate the death, determine how the death occurred, when, where. They also were involved with identification. The coroner also had the power to subpoena people and to interview witnesses. They could also order a medical evaluation. And if the coroner was unavailable, then the justice of the peace would step in. Now, in 1901, they removed the coroner position completely and just gave the, the duties or responsibilities of the coroner to the um, uh, justice of the peace. And then over the years, a few changes occurred um, as uh, is up on the board there. And in 1929, uh, the local health officer was charged with investigating unattended deaths and reporting anything suspicious to the, um, the coroner. Um, and there's some other changes that occurred uh, uh, that, that you can see up there. <clears throat> then the big change came in 1975. And this is when the uh, state of Arizona decided to, to adopt the uh, medical examiner system. So now the medical examiner again would be a, a physician uh, licensed in the state that would head the um, death investigation unit of, of the county, the medical examiner's office. I don't know what this picture is. It looks like they're examining a, a body or something. It, uh, I can't even tell if it's a body. I don't even know where I got this thing. But it, uh, I can imagine something like this uh, probably happened along the, along the way. Now, before um, the, the office was constructed, the first medical examiner, the, it was called the Office of the Coroner's Pathologist, 
Uh, apparently there was a rotation basis where autopsies were done at funeral homes and so each funeral home that wanted to be involved in the process would go on a week rotation. I imagine they got uh, money for allowing autopsies to be performed at their facility or maybe they had uh, first crack at uh, performing the, the funeral arrangements for that individual, I'm not, not sure. Um, but uh, it would be a rotational basis. But in uh, 1968, the um, medical examiner, at that time the office of the coroner pathologist, was constructed downtown. And this is part of the uh, county complex. If you uh, tr try to orient you here, I, I took this picture from right outside City Hall. And right to the, this side, which is west, would be the federal building. And then uh, th this large uh, building over here is that hotel downtown that um, they try to renovate and try to use for the, uh, um, try to use for the convention center. Is that in, owned by Humberto Lopez or something? And he keeps trying to modify that. Um, if, if you look a little bit to the east, then you can see the county uh, building. So again, here's the former medical examiner's office or office of the coroner's pathologist. This uh, used to be called the... Uh, Health and Welfare Building. They may have changed it with the new uh, Public Health Building. This is the administration, and this building over here is the uh, Superior Court Building. <clears throat> who, who was involved with the death investigation? Who are the people? Um, Associates in Laboratory Medicine uh, was involved. Um, what, was that the name of the group uh, for, for a long time? Associates in Laboratory Medicine? In Southern Arizona Pathologist. Southern, thank you, Peter. Um, and and the, the lion's share of the work, I believe, went uh, to Dr. Lewis Hirsch, who was uh, standing here doing uh, an autopsy. Now, Dr. Solomon uh, tells me that this was not uh, the, the practice of everybody doing uh, autopsies at the time, to do them barehanded and uh, with, without uh, a mask, uh, without a shoe cover. But it seemed like the staff uh, kind of followed uh, suit or, and uh, also did the same thing. Um, but uh, doc, Dr. Hirsch was performing exams for, for many years. Um, I, I don't know when it's, uh, Peter, do you know when if he first started doing uh, forensic work? Was it in the 50s or? Yeah. What, the 50s? Yeah, probably. And, uh, and then uh, Dr. Brucker joined uh, him in the, in the 60s and I guess he was doing uh, a lot of the work. But all the pathologists, I guess, went in a rotation there. Uh, we, aspect of where it's St. Mary's or St. Joe's, every eighth weekend we had to cover the uh, medical examiner's office. Yeah. But that was a real, a real experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, uh, and, and then Dr. Uh, Joseph Halka and Dr. Valerie Rao uh, were involved um, in, towards the end of uh, the 70s and early 80s. And then in 1981, uh, the contract for the medical examiner work uh, went to the University of Arizona and Dr. Free was named the, the chief at that time. Now also working with him was uh, Dr. Jim Byers who uh, had some training in forensic pathology. He was board certified. So but both of them were board certified forensic pathologists. As I mentioned earlier, Dr. Freedy was already the chief medical examiner of Cochise County. But now he had uh, Pima County for, for a little while before Dr. Gary Flores took over Cochise. And uh, Dr. Byers uh, left, I think, around in 82, 83, and then uh, Dr. Jones came in, uh, soon followed by uh, Dr. Henry. And uh, they were uh, together for those years, 81 to 87. Uh, th this is uh, Morris Reyna, Mo Reyna, who is a, um, I, I had lunch with him uh, a week ago. Uh, he, he was an investigator that worked with <clears throat> the Associates in Laboratory Medicine group and then also started working with um, Dr. Freedy. He's a former uh, homicide uh, detective for the Tucson Police Department and uh, is still doing very well. <clears throat> in uh, 1987 uh, uh, to 91, the uh, group was uh, myself and Dr. Henry and Dr. Jones. And in 1991, Dr. Henry went to become the chief medical examiner of uh, Denver and um, Dr. Jones died unexpectedly, <clears throat> le leaving me uh, alone. But soon uh, to follow was Dr. Howard, who had been recruited by uh, Dr. Jones. And then over the years, a number of people have come through the office. Uh, a number of them are still there. But um, the, you, you can see the list there. Currently at the office, <clears throat> Dr. Greg Hess is the chief medical examiner. 
Dr. Eric Peters is a deputy chief, and the other pathologists are Dr. Cynthia Porterfield, who's uh, with us to tonight, and uh, Dr. David Winston, and uh, Dr. Venus Singh. And they're all um, board certified forensic pathologists. Just a, a couple of um, developments of the office that have occurred somewhat recently. Um, so there are, with myself working part-time, six full-time forensic pathologists there at the office. We have a full-time forensic anthropologist, which is very rare for a medical examiner's office. There usually isn't enough work to warrant uh, hiring a full-time forensic uh, anthropologist. But we have a full-time forensic anthropologist and a second full-time anthropology position, which is a postgraduate or postdoctoral uh, position. Um, we have an investigation system that is, that is new where all our investigators go out to every scene before a lot of the uh, investigation work was done over the phone. And uh, the, the uh, investigator supervisor is here tonight, uh, Mr. Gene Hernandez, uh, who is board certified by the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigation. And uh, three of the um, 10 or 11 investigators we have are, uh, have such uh, credentials, and we hope to get everybody um, that way. And uh, very significantly is the fact that uh, recently the office was um, uh, credited by the National Association of Medical Examiners, uh, which, which is something most offices uh, don't have. So th things are going uh, very well there. Now if you look at the, uh, the state, <coughs> um, of course everybody, every medical examiner case in Pima County is evaluated by the medical examiner's office, but uh, we also do uh, every medical examiner case for Santa Cruz County and just about every medical examiner case for Pinal County. And then for uh, Graham, Greenlee, uh, Gila, La Paz, we, <coughs> every medical examiner autopsy is done at the Pima County office. And then we get selected autopsies from Yuma, Navajo, and, and Apache. And, and I think part of the popularity of the office is uh, due to uh, Dr. Freeze's efforts of um, education across the state. He, he would go to some of these other counties and put on uh, seminars and, and people would recognize uh, Dr. Freedy and, and would recognize the quality of uh, the Pima County office. And um, that probably has a lot to do with why um, our, the office has uh, uh, such loyal customers with some of these other counties. Oh, and I, I should have mentioned Cochise County uh, is probably going to come to Pima County pretty soon because Dr. Flores has retired from uh, doing uh, forensic pathology work. So uh, there's negotiations underway right now to do everything for Cochise. I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, Pima County Forensic Science Center, which is the current facility. It was constructed in uh, 1989, and it was at that time that the Pima County, uh, Pima County took over the whole operation. So before people were employed by the university in 1989. Everybody working in the medical examiner's office became a county employee at the time that this office was, um, was completed. It's really two buildings. This is the administration building and this is the examination storage area. And this large white building over here is the uh, Abrams um, uh, Health Department building. This is the view looking to the uh, West, and you can see uh, what used to be called Kino Hospital, now at the <coughs> University Medical Center South Campus, I, I believe. Uh, this is a little old, and uh, there's some changes in the uh, pavement and parking lot. But, uh, this is the inside of the storage facility. Uh, everybody is in a plastic pouch or plastic bag. There is room for about 110 people inside the storage facility, and there is an outside storage facility with a similar um, capacity. This is what the inside of the examination area looks like. Uh, th this is uh, the um, one of two, here, here are the both exam tables. We have these uh, nice looking uh, lights here that look like they're uh, emerg I mean, uh, operating room lights because they are. Uh, we hardly ever use them, but they look really nice. <laughs> <coughs> we have a couple of uh, scales. Uh, this is a room, a glass um, in between a, a room, an observation room, where people can observe autopsies, and that, that happens sometimes when law enforcement in particular want to view the autopsy, but they don't want to be in there and, and get the full experience. So, or it may, be, it may be that they don't have uh, the qualifications to wear the mask that we wear because we require everybody to be approved to wear a TB effective mask and also that they uh, are fit tested for that mask. 
So the, the individuals, as you saw in the refrigeration unit, are all on trays, and those trays get pulled out and placed onto a rolling table. Then the rolling table gets moved around inside the exam room where photographs are taken, evidence is collected, the clothes are removed, the medical treatment is removed. And then once the external examination is done, the uh, individual is wheeled over to the um, uh, workstation, which, which is a complicated sink, basically. And then that's where the uh, autopsy, the internal examination begins. This is that outside refrigeration unit that I mentioned, which uh, w was required because we had so many people dying in the desert, we just ran out of space. Uh, there were 69 people that died in, the, um, in July of 2005, and we just ran out of space. What kinds of deaths are, are evaluated or examined, investigated by the medical examiner's office? This is determined by state law. So the law says that if anybody has knowledge of a death that falls under one of these circumstances, they're su supposed to report the death to the nearest peace officer. Then the peace officer will notify the medical <coughs> examiner's office. There are 10 different categories. I've combined uh, death occurring in a prison and death of a prisoner, so you only see nine up there. But anytime there's no physician who's uh, available or willing to sign the death certificate, deaths due to violence, uh, sudden unexpected death, suspicious, unusual, or unnatural death. I mentioned the prison. Any death that might be related to a, a surgical procedure or anesthesia. Any death that might be related to a person's occupation or employment. Um, any, uh, let's see, any death that might present a, a public health hazard. So the, these are the kinds of deaths that need to be reported but aren't necessarily accepted uh, by the medical examiner's office. So I want to spend a little time just talking about what it is we do at the office. You know, what, what, what are the, you know, what, what do we want to try to find out? I mean, what, what are the, the duties, our goals? Identification is a big one. Uh, most people, we have no problem identifying because most people die in hospitals or they die at home or they die in a, maybe a nursing home or some other kind of medical care facility. And families bring them to those places and we have a good way of identifying them. The difficulty arises when you've got somebody who's uh, been disfigured through either decomposition or through a fire uh, and there's nobody around uh, with them to tell us uh, uh, who they are. There's been loss of contact. So those are the more difficult uh, challenges and, and we see a lot of those again because of the border crossers. This particular individual apparently died in a plane crash along with a number of other people and this identification was found near him and they're not the same person. So it, it just kind of hammers the point that um, you, you need to be very careful about identification. You, you uh, can get in a lot of trouble. There was a case in Phoenix where two girls were involved in a, a car crash along with other people. One of them, they were, they were both uh, disfigured. One was in the hospital, one died, and the hospital incorrectly identified the um, the girl in the hospital as, as the girl who had died. So they had a funeral for the one that was alive and um, the one that was uh, dead was actually alive. Anyway, have to be very careful with identification. So th this is a badly decomposed individual and you've got a dog tag there and it gives, you a, it gives us a place to start. If we don't have some kind of identification to allow us a, a starting point, the odds of identification are, are kind of slim. Fingerprints are a great way to identify <clears throat> people. No two people have been shown to have the same fingerprints. Of course, not everybody's been fingerprinted, and that's an argument that the lawyers have sometimes, is that you can't be sure that two people don't have finger the same fingerprints because you haven't looked at everybody. Um, but uh, we, you know, fingerprints uh, are great. Uh, there is an, um, an error rate associated with the, the people that are evaluating the prints. But anyway, they're only, as, they're only good if you can compare it to somebody. So if you don't have anything to compare to, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't help you much. Uh, things like scars, marks, tattoos are, uh, are useful and um, something that we might use if other things fall in place, if there are no inconsistencies. <clears throat> Radiography is a great way. Uh, this is... Um, a post-mortem radiograph, this, uh, if any radiologists are here, you can tell that there's a, a lot of gas in the tissue and so you've got kind of a moth-eaten appearance of the, uh, the bone. 
Uh, so uh, this is a post-mortem, anti-mortem. We've got a couple of orthopedic screws in the same location of the lumbar spine. Um, other things uh, matching, uh, th this would be good information. But you don't have to have orthopedic hardware. You can base, uh, the, um, base the identification on th something like the frontal sinuses, which are pretty unique, or the, the lipping of the vertebra, perhaps, are, are unique in an individual. Unfortunately, often we don't have radiographs to compare. And then there's a DNA testing, which is just a, a wonderful way of uh, making identification. Uh, it's very resilient. The laboratories have gotten very good at extracting DNA. Uh, we, again, with the people that die in the desert, we have some people that are very uh, bad off, um, uh, skeletonized, weathered bone, and they've been able to get a DNA out of that. The problem is it's very expensive. And in the case of border crossers, the families don't, can't come forward and um, submit their DNA to be placed into a database to compare with all the unidentified uh, remains that we have. Uh, so DNA is great, but um, it's not used a whole lot in the office. So that's identification. Some other things that we do is you know, document and interpret um, uh, injuries and disease processes so we can best come up with the cause of death so that we can answer some of the questions that come up during um, um, court and you know, legal proceedings. Uh, th this is a stab wound of a man's uh, chest, and um, by, re by approximating the edges, you can, pretty s you can see clearly in this case, it's not always clear, that the weapon, the knife, was a single-edged uh, weapon. Um, th this is a, a woman who was beaten with a, an object, and you can see multiple overlapping abrasions here, or scrapes, around the chest with a couple of isolated um, injuries here. And we see that the object, this is of course a pattern injury, which are great because anytime you have a pattern injury, you can really narrow down the possibilities of what could have caused it. But we've got a kind of peculiar rectangular uh, uh, abrasion with a circular abrasion and a kind of a halo around it. Now, if you find uh, something like this in a person's possession, uh, you've got a, a perfect match of the edge of this piece of plywood with the nail poking out a little bit so that the, uh, the nail head will come in contact. It'll push the skin away from the board so you get that halo around it. And um, <clears throat> incidentally, there's some um, eyebrow hairs. I didn't show you her, um, her face, but she had a laceration of her eyebrow, and so I'm sure these are eyebrow hairs. And DNA off this would confirm that... Uh, that she indeed is a, uh, the person that was struck with this. Uh, con this is a slam dunk diagnosis. We always like it when we can say something with a high degree of certainty. This is a contact gunshot wound of the head with a nice muzzle imprint on the, um, uh, on the skin there. This is a gunshot wound where the weapon is a little further back. So we've got soot deposits around the wound. And then you can see these light brown particles here, which are um, gunpowder particles. And if the gun is a little further back, you can see this speckled appearance of the gunpowder striking the skin, which is called stippling. The gunpowder particles will create little scrapes and little bruises at distances out to about two to four feet. Um, and, and this can be uh, helpful information in figuring out uh, what happened and confirming or refuting uh, people's stories. <clears throat> Now notice this wound here has uh, no stippling around it, and uh, the reason for that, even though the weapon was probably about the same distance, was that the hair blocked the particles from, from reaching the skin and causing those wounds. Kind of like you don't, you don't see much around here because we shaved the, the hair away. Uh, collecting evidence is... Um, Cer certainly something that we do. If foul play is suspected, then we'll take um, a, a typical homicide collection kit, which would include taking uh, fingernail uh, clippings. First, uh, we used to scrape the fingernails underneath the fingernails and take those scrapings and then clip the fingernails, turn those over to law enforcement, and then they would look for, um, in, in some cases, whether there's foreign DNA on the hands in case there was any physical contact between the assailant and the decedent. Um, now DNA testing is, is, so, um, is so good with very small quantities, we've gone to uh, taking swabs of the fingertips rather than you know, scraping underneath because we ended up scraping so much of the person's own DNA off that it was uh, overwhelming anything else that might be on that. 
So these are uh, s uh, swabs, containers that uh, are used for collecting evidence. So uh, in addition to the fingernail clippings and scrapings, we take uh, swabs of different uh, openings in the body, primarily looking for um, sexual assault. All of that gets turned over to law enforcement. We don't do any work trying to analyze evidence. We collect the information or collect the evidence, turn it over to law enforcement, and then it's their crime labs that will go ahead and analyze the evidence if uh, if it's warranted. They they don't analyze it in every uh, instance. And then we have to make sure that we have a chain of custody, of course, any time that we have uh, uh, evidence that's collected. Bullets are certainly uh, evidence, and any time somebody has a bullet in them, we remove the bullet and we do a complete autopsy if there are bullets inside the body um, because of course the bullets can be matched to a particular weapon if, if the, the bullets in good enough shape. Again that's something that the crime lab does and not, not the medical examiner's office. Estimating the post-mortem interval um, is something that we're often asked to do and despite what you see on some of these television shows that I showed before and some of these movies it's a very imprecise determination, uh, as, is, uh, as are a number of other things in, in the uh, profession. But one of the postmortem features that is looked at to determine the postmortem interval is, of, of course, rigor mortis. A rigor mortis is stiffening of the muscle that is thought to be the result of um, loss of ATP, and it becomes noticeable typically around three, uh, four hours uh, after death. It becomes maximum somewhere 12, 15 hours, and then goes away. But because it's a chemical reaction, it's accelerated by heat. So in a hot environment, rigor mortis will come on more quickly and leave more, more quickly. And we, you really have to take a temperature into consideration. Now, it can also be useful uh, to determine whether or not somebody's telling you the right story. Uh, for example, if this person was found in an apartment on the floor with the arm up like that and the roommate says that the night before this guy was laying on the floor watching television he went to bed when he came out he found him like that you know there's that's probably not the truth <clears throat> because his arm wouldn't uh, move up like that so either he was moved or something under the arm was moved another thing that we looked at is, or look at is uh, lividity uh, or also called liver mortis or liver mortis uh, liver mortis And, and this is the settling of the blood that occurs um, in the body. So when people die, the, the blood, it's kind of like having a tube of blood and the red cells will, will go to the bottom of the tube. Uh, so the, the red blood cells move down according to gravity and will cause um, a purple, purple red discoloration of the dependent uh, parts of the body. If you push on the area of discoloration and the um, color goes away, that's uh, called blanching, and this typically occurs if the person's been dead less than 10, 12 hours. It, it's not, you know, it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's just something that can be helpful. Lividity itself is usually visible within a couple hours uh, after death. If it, only it was this this simple. No, Gary Larson. <clears throat> a certified cause and manner of death, cer certainly important. Uh, th this is a portion of the old death certificate. Now it's all, um, it's all done on, uh, online, and you fill out the death certificate on the computer. Uh, but anyway, some of the information is the same, and th this is the cause of death section, this is the manner of death section. So the cause of death is the injury or disease process that caused a person to die, obviously. Um, Nobody gets trained on death certification. I think it's uh, rare. If anybody got training, specific training in death certification, I think that would be very unusual. But anyway, we, we do a lot of that, and um, we want to, of course, come up with the cause of death, not a cause of death. And it's not always easy, as, as many of you know. Um, the, the cause of death is, is not just based on the autopsy. It's a synthesis of the uh, patient's history, the scene investigation, a behavioral history, of course the autopsy, and then some of the ancillary studies of the autopsy, the toxicology testing, uh, microbiology in some cases, and certainly a histologic examination is important for the cause of death determination. 
And then the manner of death is, is how the death occurred. Was it by their own hand? Was it by someone else's hand? Uh, was it um, a freak of nature? Uh, lightning, something like that. We, we call car crashes accidents. Uh, or is it a natural disease? Uh, and, and so that's, we have to be concerned about filling that out. Physicians in the community don't, don't need to worry about that because they should all be natural. <clears throat> this is a, a nice pie diagram showing the breakdown of the different manners of death that occurred over 2011 uh, at, at the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office. This just is Pima County and not all the other counties. The majority, or I guess this, not the majority, but the single largest category is natural death, which is typical for a medical examiner's office. The most common manner of death is going to be natural. Ours is a little unusual because very close behind natural is accident. And, and it's skewed because, again, of the border crosser situation, where so many of those deaths are uh, accidental. Uh, then uh, rounding it out is a, a suicide over here at 12 percent and um, homicide uh, <coughs> is uh, 6 percent and, that, and that's kind of typical you have about twice as many suicides as homicides and you, you never hear about the suicides. I, one thing I was really surprised about when I started doing the work is the number of suicides. Uh, uh, you always hear about the homicides but suicides aren't publicized. Authorized cremation and uh, organ tissue request. It, so <clears throat> Anytime somebody wants to cremate their loved one, the medical examiner's office reviews the uh, death certificate. And some of you may have uh, issued a death certificate and had the medical examiner's office call up and ask you to clarify what the cause of death is. Um, and that's something that we're, we, we do a lot, our investigators do anyway. So physicians every day will review the death certificates online. And then for those death certificates which seem a little unusual, incomplete, suspicious, then we gather more information about them. So this is one death certificate that came through the office and obviously there's something wrong here and this, this should have been investigated by the medical examiner. But sometimes we'll get something like uh, intracranial hemorrhage and that's all that's there. Or sepsis and that's all that's there. There are so many different things that can lead to those um, problems that we really have to gather more information. And testifying is certainly something that we do. Uh, we used to do a lot more of it, but then the um, county attorney's office started to reach a lot more pleas and, and the number of uh, testimonies dropped. Uh, and for every time you testify, you're going to have a pretrial interview. And then there are a number of uh, interviews that take place without a, a trial that follows. I, I think this is a plastic brain, at least uh, I hope it is. Sometimes you feel like this when you testify. But, uh, um, now I'm uh, going to finish up here by talking about the border crosser situation because when you talk about death investigation in, in Pima County, southern Arizona, you, you can't leave this out because it's become such a big part of the office operation. Uh, we um, had to develop a, a classification for the individuals because we were getting so many calls asking us for numbers. How many died this, this month? How many died you know, over the year? So we decided to start keeping track of, of people uh, who we thought had come through uh, without documentation across the U.S.-Mexico border who died in transit that we thought, uh, again, were from another, another country. And uh, we decided to use uh, undocumented um, border crosser or UBC as that entity. And we really didn't notice things were changing. I think the big eye-opener was in 2001 when 14 people died from one event uh, in uh, May. I think it was May 21st of um, 2001. Uh, there was a party of 28, 29 people that came across the border. They were trying to go to Ajo, but uh, for some reason they veered off to the uh, west and were heading more towards Yuma and 14 of these people died and uh, they were strewn across the desert. They brought all those people to our office. And, um, and then we, we realized that maybe we're in the midst of something. Because if you look at the numbers here, back, back in the 90s, there were border crosser deaths, but we didn't even th think about it. There were so many other deaths that we had to contend with that this, this was not something we considered as a phenomenon. 
But in 2000, all that changed, and, and so you can see that the number spiked quite a bit. 2001 is when that, that group died. And they just, the numbers just kept climbing. I mentioned uh, 2005 was a very particular bad year, uh, and that's where 69 people uh, had died in, um, in one month. Now, these statistics are not the number of people that died, but these are the people that were found. Um, so we don't know, nobody knows how many people die each year. All we know is how many bodies are recovered. This, this is one of the individuals that uh, was uh, in that 14, that group of 14 um, in the May of 2001. So there are more causes than just the heat as far as the cause of death. Um, if you look at the, the early years that we monitored, uh, you can see the heat was the most common cause if you compare the yellow bars here. Um, but that changed uh, over the, the last few years. Now we're seeing a higher number of undetermined deaths. And the reason for that is that we're seeing a lot more people who are skeletonized. So I think there are more people out there looking and more people being found than people who had died in years past, um, sometimes months past. Doesn't take long to get skeletonized. So uh, now we're getting a large number of, uh, of the undetermined category. Uh, other causes of death would be, uh, MVA stands for motor vehicle uh, accidents, where people are loaded into um, uh, vehicles in an unsafe fashion, multiple people packed together, sometimes I've heard stacked together in vehicles that aren't really meant for, uh, for road travel, they're not well maintained, they're driving excessively fast, they uh, roll over and everybody gets ejected. So often we have multiple fatalities from one event. This is a homicide category. We just had two people from um, Pinal County that were shot in a truck. It was in the, the paper today. Usually when we see people die as a result of homicide, it's the, re it's the result of um, <coughs> the, the coyotes or the smugglers fighting amongst themselves, or there's some drug tra traffic or drug trade involved, and, and that's why we see homicides. So, so far, uh, knock on wood, we haven't seen any vigilante type of uh, uh, homicidal deaths. Um, there are a, a few people that die from natural causes, and then there's a smattering of other causes. Included in, in there is, is um, hypothermia, the cold exposure, and we had, uh, we had 19 of those deaths in, uh, in 2010. If you remember, we actually had rain uh, that winter in 2010, quite a bit of rain, and uh, when you're cold and wet, it's, it's not a very uh, healthy combination. This uh, pie chart just shows what the nationality is of the individuals. So you can see the great majority of them are uh, from Mexico. But we have uh, individuals from a number of other places, uh, El Salvador, um, Ecuador, Nic Nicaragua. And th this is um, for last year. Normally, early on, um, we have a big hump right here for the hot months. But because people are out there and finding the skeletonized remains, we're, we're getting um, greater numbers in some of the colder months. So if you see uh, a, like 15 in the month of February, you can bet that the majority of those people are going to be skeletonized remains because uh, um, they usually, of course, they won't die from heat in those months. The, the location of death is typically, yeah, you have a question? Did you have, no? Uh, the, where the people die, well, especially from heat, is going to be uh, nor north of Sassabee here and, and north of Lukeville, with a lot of deaths occurring on the Tone Odom uh, Reservation. Identification, as you might imagine, is, is really difficult. We started out with a success rate of about 70 percent, but now that's probably closer to 55, 60 percent because, again, of the, uh, the uh, skeletonization of a lot of these people. And we have to find some kind of uh, documentation with them to give us a start. And so we, we're looking through tattered clothing, weathered clothing, looking for any concealed compartments, looking underneath the soles of uh, insoles of shoes, uh, looking for um, any kind of documentation that might have a person's name or some phone numbers. If we're lucky, we'll get one of these um, identification cards which um, is a Mexican voter registration card that has a fingerprint on the back of that. And so if we're lucky enough to have a hand that we can print, we'll compare it to that card. Now, you need to l see that card or view that card with some skepticism because quite often those cards are not valid. 
their, their, uh, their, their fake IDs or they might be somebody else's ID. But if we, if we have hands that we can print, we'll, we'll print the hands. Unfortunately, sometimes they're nothing but bone. Um, sometimes the hands are like this, where the hands are mummified. They're dried out, the skin is wrinkled, they're hard as a rock. But if we take the hands and put them in a solution, they'll, they'll plump up and we can actually get pretty good fingerprints off of a hand uh, that, that you saw. This is something that we, um, that we have to do uh, routinely throughout the, well, through the summer months primarily. This is um, not an uncommon presentation or uh, not, not an uncommon condition that the bodies are in. And, and this is where the anthropologists are extremely valuable. They can look at the remains and tell whether it's a man or a woman, their approximate age, what, what, what their background, their, their um, uh, uh, nation, uh, not, not nation of origin, but their continent of origin, uh, um, you know, whether or not they fit the uh, typical mixed uh, racial background of a Hispanic person. <coughs> and then we, we also take um, missing persons information. So we have uh, individuals that will, will take missing person information, enter it into a database, and compare the missing person information with uh, information we have about the uh, unidentified there. If we know somebody died within a certain time frame and we know somebody else was missing in the same time frame and might be in around the same location, this is, gives us um, you know, a, a possibility of a match. And, and the, um, we're lucky enough to have funding to get um, the great majority of the unidentified individuals uh, typed into a DNA database. But as I mentioned, we still don't have a way of getting families into that database for comparison, but hopefully that'll, that'll come down the road and we get people identified. So that is a uh, lot of information, kind of a, a run through a death investigation in our county, and I'm open for any questions. Yes? So. <laughs> well, we, we don't do any um, uh, laboratory work, but um, I, I was at the uh, Armed Forces Medical Examiner facility. Uh, I actually got asked to be part of the group that um, looked into the mishandling of bodies at Dover Air Force Base, and there was a, a committee that was looking into that um, at the request of the Department of Defense. And, I was very surprised to learn that the, their office, which has a top-notch DNA laboratory, can get stuff within a few hours. I just, yeah, right. yeah I didn't think that was possible. But, uh, so there, I guess, I guess there's a way of doing that. But most of the time, if you ask a, a crime lab, like in Arizona, we were waiting for years sometimes, uh, in, in months, two, three months was kind of the norm. Um, yeah. uh, yes? Tell me something about the difficulties with uh, potential child abuse uh, cases that come into your uh, lab. Well, there's nothing that will strike fear in a forensic pathologist's heart more than the, the potential child abuse case. Um, they're they're about the most difficult kinds of um, deaths that we deal with. Uh, because you know the child could not have done it on their own, so some, somebody or something's responsible, and you've got a very aggressive defense counsel that can bring up a lot of uh, very obscure uh, explanations for how injuries occurred, and then you've got a group of people that do nothing but testify as experts for the defense in those cases. So um, fortunately, we don't see a whole lot, and we're very grateful for that, but when we do have them, we're extremely careful and thorough and um, uh, keep our fingers crossed. But they're, they're extremely difficult. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. What kind of x-ray facilities do you have and how often are they useful? Well, we don't have a, we don't have a, a facility per se, but we do have, uh, we're fortunate now to have a digital processor and uh, we, we use a couple of portable, GE portable, um, uh, machines, and then we, we use a um, Kodak, I think, uh, uh, processor. Uh, it's the, uh, it's not the complete digital one, uh, it's, it's the partial digital one. So um, w our, our people are trained, really on, receive on-the-job training, and um, 
They'll, our, our assistants will take the radiographs and, and we'll view them now digitally, and, which is a, a lot nicer than the old way because we can adjust the intensity and et cetera. So that, that's about what, what we have. Yeah. Yes. yes, sir. I know that Dr. Freddie and, and Dr. Berkby were both on a certain case in which they uh, contributed their services. They belong to an organization that does that throughout the United States, at least, if not beyond borders. Can you make any comments? I think that I think that's the Vidoc Society, uh, I'm if, I'm, sure. if I'm correct. Is, isn't that what the, the Vidoc Society? Yeah, it was a very elite group of uh, people that would look at uh, uh, difficult cases and um, come up with determinations, and he was a member of that for some, for some years. Yeah. Yes? I'm impressed with their facilities and what seems to be wonderfully qualified people. And I'm thinking about how 45 years ago, if somebody died in a hospital and it wasn't completely clear how they died, they got an autopsy. Now almost nobody does because of expense. Um, you're, making, you're not having too much problem with expenses of just fine services? <coughs> Well, we're, you know, we're talking about a couple of different things here. With, with the medical examiner's office, it's um, funded by the county government, and um, in the hospitals, you're dealing with uh, basically gratis a procedure because um, you don't get reimbursed by insurance or anything. And and so I think hospitals are. And some of you know better than I about this because I'm not a hospital administrator, but. Uh, uh, yeah, hospitals are reluctant to perform autopsies because it costs them and, and uh, it, you know, it takes a lot of time and they're, they're uh, often controversial and there's a lot of other time expenditures that may go along with that after, you know, the autopsy's done. So, um, yeah, the, the rate of autopsies in hospitals has gone down steadily and uh, I, mean, I know the university, uh, Dr. Weinstein's here and, and you know, ran a department and um, can probably tell us more about you know the history, but yeah, they're they're declining. The University of Arizona does autopsies for not only the University Medical Center but some of the other hospitals in town, and also from their, from Phoenix, they're starting to send some of them down. And they do, you know, p people do pay for some. I don't know where that money comes from. Yes. Right. And usually we're confident enough that we can't. Uh, but are there times when we just shouldn't or just some words of well <coughs> Yeah, I don't know if everybody heard the question, but it's, it's uh, sometimes, uh, you know, w when there's a death scene and it's your patient, you'll get called by law enforcement when they find out you're the physician, the, the attending, and they'll ask you if you're comfortable signing the death certificate. And, and if you're truly comfortable, I mean, go, go ahead and sign. If, if you if you don't know exactly what killed them, but you feel pretty comfortable that it's a natural death, um, you don't have to be 100% correct in, in your determination. You, you go with your best, your best shot. Uh, if you think that maybe they died from something unnatural, that, that's the time to say, uh, no, no, I, I really don't want to because I think the person, you know, they were, they were very depressed, they've had suicidal thoughts and ideation, they've got a lot of potential, um, lethal, potentially lethal medications, I, I really don't want to sign. But if, if you feel pretty comfortable it's a natural death, and you have some idea. If they have a list of you know, uh, ischemic heart disease, or COPD, uh, whatnot, if you put one of those on there and go with your best, uh, your best shot, uh, you, you won't have any problem. I, I've never heard of anybody getting in trouble for putting the wrong cause of death down. You know, if, you know, it doesn't happen. Yes, sir? Two questions. Uh, do insurance companies pay for in-hospital autopsies? I don't think so. I, does anybody know? No, no, no. They don't. They don't. Second question: Are you seeing an increase in uh, incidents and deaths from drug overdoses, both prescription and non-prescription? I don't know that there's been an increase. Um, we we see we've been seeing more people die from methadone, and so I think there are some trends. But I don't know if the overall number has changed, but methadone is being used more and more frequently as an analgesic because I guess it's cheap. And um, so we're, we're seeing more of those, but maybe some uh, fewer deaths that are from some of the other narcotics like uh, Percodan. 
So, yeah, yeah. Ron. I, I just wanted to compliment on your tour as chief medical examiner. You continue the tradition that Dr. Freedy uh, established of excellence, uh, great reputation, and great respect. We're all very proud of your service to the county. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yes, yes. I'd like to add to that uh, comment on Rob Weinstein. Uh, it's interesting, it's interesting that Maricopa County built a, a what, $12 million forensic science center, and their business plan was that they were going to attract the business from all the other counties in the state. And uh, they were shocked to learn that, uh, that uh, our county had the preferred medical examiner. And so when you see that map with all of the other counties going here, there were winners and losers. There's no question that quality won out, which I think is terrific. Yeah, thanks.